All right, guys, welcome to our live interview today on the Pain Masterminds Network page. I'm happy for all you guys who've made it this afternoon to take some time out of your day. It's afternoon here in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, we have Linda, I believe, joining us from uh, Colorado. So we'll talk about a little bit about where Linda's at and what she's doing. But uh, I will try to monitor the boards here. And if you guys have questions, don't hesitate to put them up on the comment thread. I'll definitely pose those to Linda as we go through her talk. Linda brings the occupational therapy perspective, but she also brings a lived experience or a pain perspective. So I think we're double lucky to have her here today to share her perspective. Um, so I'm excited. I got the pleasure of meeting Linda what's a month ago, or a little bit over a month ago, yeah. at the International Association for the Study of Pain's World Congress in Boston, and we were able to have some good chats and kind of share our perspectives. But I'm also, you know, at those conferences, you get to like talk with people in little blips, and you never get to spend enough time to really chat as much as you'd like to. So I'm excited today to, to talk with Linda and, and learn more about her practice. So with that said, Linda, would you mind introducing yourself to the folks? Sure. Hi, folks. Uh, Linda Crawford, so occupational therapist, uh, going on 29 years. So obviously, I was just born in OT. Um, so yeah, I've, uh, if you want to know about my professional background, uh, I specialized in neuro rehabilitation for the first 10 or so years of my career, uh, stroke and brain injury that included um, a lot of neuro re -ed, cognitive and perceptual retraining, that kind of stuff. Then moved to Austria for three years and couldn't work. So got to find out that I had some hobbies and got to practice OT on myself uh, for a while and came back and decided uh, to kind of go to a little less stressful type of OT work. And so I uh, did per diem work and for a long time, home health, acute care. Uh, worked at a hospital that had a lot of different units, rehab, uh, skilled nursing, burn unit, outpatient. So did lots and lots of stuff there. Um, so my story partly is that, you know, I got hurt on the job. So we can talk about that whole pain story separately. But um, after rehabbing, if you will, myself out of that, I went back into private practice about four and a half years ago, uh, specializing in pain rehabilitation with an occupational therapy kind of lens, but also very collaboratively and with other professions, specifically physical therapists, of course, which um, I love, and um, massage and yoga and counselors and just all these people that I kind of found and, and built sort of a, a little group. And so that's what I do now. I have a kind of small specialty practice here in Colorado. See people in their homes. I actually went clinicless uh, almost two years ago. So I found out that I really wanted to work with people in real life. So that's kind of what I do. Yeah, it doesn't, get any more, it doesn't get more real than working with somebody in their home in the environment, which I think gives some unique benefits. You get to see the patient kind of where they are and functioning in their environment, maybe where their stressors lie, where all their maybe psychosocial issues are a little bit more front and center. So yeah. um, before I want to definitely talk about that and kind of how your practice works in the in the home But I'd, I'd like to if you don't mind sharing a little bit about your Experience with pain and maybe how it's kind of sounds like it may have had an impact on you to where it's driven you to where you're practicing today But I'd love to hear more about it Yeah uh, Definitely mark and thank you. Thanks for asking mark because I, I told mark before we started that really this is the first time somebody's really asked me to share my story um, because as a professional, as a clinician, you know, maybe you share little bits here and there, but not so much about what happened to you and, and how it changed you and what the experience was. But um, I think the important thing about listening to a pain story too is not necessarily what happened to me and, you know, the pain part of it itself, but more of how it affected me as a person. And so that's, kind of goes back to who I who I am or the person I was when I got injured and how it changed that. So if that's okay, Mark, I'd like to share a little bit about that, um, just so you kind of know me yeah. um, a little better. So um, I grew up in a small town in Maine, and trust me, I'm not going to make this really long, but um, went to college for chemistry, thought I wanted to be a chemist, and 
had the highest lab score in, in chemistry and was getting C's and D's in my tests and kind of discovered that that wasn't really me. So I went and did pottery after that and dropped out of school. Um, and then, you know, back then in the 70s, you ran off with your boyfriend, so I decided to do that. So, uh, but the good thing about that piece is uh, for me in my life, I, I really had an adventure, adventurous streak in me that small town didn't quite fit. And uh, he led me into doing off-road professional car rallying. I was a co-driver. Uh, and so I traveled all over the US and even in Europe did European rallies. Um, first Americans to do the Swedish rally. Um, three national championships. I, so I have real issues. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's kind of a little unusual piece about my story, but it sort of tells you a little bit more about me as a person and um, like to travel, adventurous, that kind of thing. Uh, and so when I got hurt on the job, it was a very simple thing. I was just helping a woman move from her bed to her wheelchair. And at the time, I was really working on my own fitness. I wanted to climb one of the big mountains here in Colorado. And so I was in really good shape. And I thought, well, I've been doing this a long time. I won't get hurt. Uh, and she dropped on me. And I, you know, I've moved people for many, many years. And that's never been a problem. But this time it was. And uh, the injuries that, that I had from that were a torn meniscus in my knee. And then I tore some muscles in my back that caused my rib to kind of come off my back. So, yeah, it's okay. It would have been okay, except that work comp and the pressure to get back to work and not lose my job kind of became a time crunch. And, uh, you know, I didn't get to pick my time frame and my, the people that would treat me. And unfortunately, um, in a rush for people to try and fix me, I suffered another injury, which is a treatment injury, which had nothing to do with those other two. Um, and that was the injury that put me into kind of a series of unfortunate events and that ended up a year later um, in chronic pain. And so I have to tell you that yesterday, October 23rd, is actually the anniversary, the uh, ninth year anniversary of when I was injured. Also, the eighth year anniversary of when all my practitioners told me, we don't know what to do with you, you're done. And I was in about a level eight pain, lost my job, stuck at home, you know, the whole story that everybody has. So, um, so it's also the day that actually they all quit. And that's when I decided it was up to me, which was a really good turning point, actually. It was very, very hard. But I went searching for the people that could help me. And I found a fantastic physical therapist who was the first person to really listen with empathy to my story and also tell me we were going to work together. It wasn't going to be just about um, doing the right things that I had been trying to do and listening to my body and going forward. And so that, that was really when the healing process started, but it was a long, bumpy road. Um, I have three treatment injuries, not just that one, over the next few years. Um, and so people often ask me, how did you kind of recover? Because I'm now four and a half years completely chronic pain free. So I went from, you know, really losing everything. Um, obviously going through similar things that Jo tells her story and I, I thank her because she tells my story about the shame and the things that we experienced with people saying we're faking it or making it up or, you know, whatever. Um, that was not true for me at all. I was working as hard as I could. Um, but I think the things that, that looking back on my story, that I can kind of identify three different things. First of all, finding the right people, right? The right people to treat me that would listen and work with me, hugely important. Um, the second piece was the emotional processing piece that I had to own and do. And that, that's where Brene Brown's work came into my life. Um, some people who know me know that I'm certified in her work, which is kind of unusual in our field. I actually haven't met anybody else who's actually certified in her work to use her curriculum. Um, but doing that emotional resilience, shame resilience work, vulnerability work, 
hugely important for me personally to work on those uh, emotional triggers of my pain. And then the third piece, of course, was understanding pain science. And coming from a neuro background, that was right in my wheelhouse. You know, when I thought I was like, ah, why didn't I know this before? Wow, this could have changed my whole career in life. And, and so, you know, I was able to kind of take that and I knew how to do neuro rehab, so I neuro rehabbed myself. Um, I did great motor imagery on myself. I, I did, you know, everything. I knew how to desensitize my nervous system. And, you know, it wasn't fast. It's a slow process. And, and you know, it took, took a few years of doing this and honestly didn't expect to be out of pain. Uh, so I'm very grateful. I'm really grateful. And I, I went from, you know, being stuck in a house and grocery shopping used to put me in bed for two days. And now, you know, I'm, I'm working on getting back to climbing that mound, but I can walk three miles real pretty, pretty good pace for my age. Um, and, you know, I'm getting out there and, and doing stuff. So um, I, I didn't know that I would go back to work again, but I decided that this is sort of my end of career time frame, and I just I just wanted to give back, and I wanted to do what I could to help people, also inspire um, my profession and other professionals to you know care for people in pain and and some of the things that that I learned and I'm still learning all the time, and so that's why that's why I do what I do. So yes, my story totally informs me, and. Uh, when I sit with people in pain and they tell me stuff, I'm like, yep, yep, get it. <laughs> I yeah, get it. I mean, that's, that's a unique thing, you know, for, for a clinician to have as far as to, to say you kind of walked in the shoes of a patient because that's one thing that a lot of us who may have not have battled some of the challenges that you and Gilletta's and uh, other folks who, who have been there done that, um, it, you know, it's hard to – no, I've had a herniated disc in my back and different things where I can kind of relate a little bit. Thankfully, you know, I didn't, the, the one overriding theme I hear is I talked to you and Gilletta is thank God I didn't get into work compensation um, when I was in that and I was able to, to stay yeah. in that system because that is a, a career ender for a lot of people just from how disabling it can be of a, of a approach to pain really. And I don't think, you know, I think the intents there can be good as far as they want a healthy worker, but man, how we go about it, not so much. And the other thing I hear from your story that I hear with a lot of, you know, stories of, of like Keith Meldrum and Gillette and others um, is almost sometimes getting better despite healthcare, you know, where you've kind of took it upon your own self to learn a lot of like pain neuroscience education and mm -hmm. learn a lot of the things that, uh, you know, we're applying here in, in, in this group and in, in clinical practice around the world as far as this whole uh, pain science uh, push. I'm curious, you know, with the OT perspective, we've had, we've been lucky to have Bronnie on and talk yes. about the occupational therapy perspective and, and obviously have you here today. I always, when I talk to OTs about, oh man, we're, we're into this cognitive retraining and cognitive restructuring. They're like, that's like the wheelhouse of an occupational therapist, Mark. This isn't new. I don't know what you guys are getting all so excited about with this, uh, like you're breaking new ground and they joke of course uh, with it and stuff, but I think there is legitimacy to that. I think we almost sometimes claim like this, oh, P and E and this cognitive reframing and cognitive restructuring is such brand new cutting edge stuff. And that's been kind of the bedrock of a lot of what you guys have been doing in the OT field. Can you just help those of us who may not have a good grip on the the real awesome skill set that an OT brings to the team? Because I think we've all discussed this over and over, that there is not one team member that's going to be the solution to it. We need to figure out how we all can lend each other our strengths and, and most importantly, make it be about the patient. So I'd love to hear kind of your perspective on, on the OT contributions to the team. Yeah, you know, it's so true, Mark. It, it takes a village or so if you want to say that, you know, and I, I tell my clients that too, you know, I'm, I'm not the only person because we all bring skill sets and strengths and even our personalities. Um, they have, you have to find the, the right fit. And so, you know, the reason I went to occupational therapy over physical therapy, say, or social work or the other um, professions that I looked at was that when, when I read about it and heard about it, learned about it, was that the, the underlying philosophy and approach was to empower people to get back into their real life and things that were meaningful to them um, and we call that occupation, the doing, right? And so 
people get confused about that term, but occupation basically is anything we do is an occup, you know, we're doing an occupation, if you will, right now. Um, so it's anything we do because we're, we're thinking, feeling, and doing beings. And so there, that's all of us. And so as an OT, we're kind of trained to, can we take a look at all of those things, the thinking, feeling, and doing, and can we come alongside people and help them become who they want to be? So there's a lot of psychology, sociology, you know, pieces as well as having the physical training and background and the neuroscience and physiology and all that. So it's, can we kind of get the big picture? And then can we also translate and help some of the other professions we work with to translate things into the real life with people? So that's why we traditionally go into the homes and environments of people because we can work in the clinic and those things can be really beneficial, but are they translating into the real world? And what do we, what do we see there? And so that's what I wanted to do. I want to, I'm kind of like this, I like to come up with ideas a lot and, you know, I like to do a lot of creative stuff and be out in the world. So it kind of, it fit me better um, to want to do that. So that's where we, the approach we kind of come in, but then, you know, we can also have specific skill sets that, we're trained in that, that we can bring to that. I know, you know, Bronnie's trained in, in um, ACT and, you know, it depends on what we then decide to go and specialize in. And, and so for me, because like with the emotional and processing, that kind of thing, the Brene's work was so important to me. That's my, that's my specialization. That's my lens. That's my language that I share with clients and help them process through elements of um, shame resilience self-compassion those kind of things and just applying them to you know yeah what's meaningful to you we're just digging a little deeper maybe you know and the physical therapists I work closely with you know we we often collaborate and, and they'll ask me okay so you know can you help this person translate this into a, 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 their real life activity or you know can you go out even in their car and like work with them getting in and out of the car make sure they're comfortable sometimes it's little things like that um or it's sensory pieces like um you know can they handle manual stuff or how do they feel about touch and can you desensitize that i do um i work with uh, pelvic pain clients which is a little specialty so there's a there's a lot of work there around um desensitization of the nervous system to to touch and um, calming that that fight or flight response. So, um, boy, there's so many things I could say, Mark. So I'll just start rambling. <laughs> no, I think that helps a lot of people because I think there is, you know, at least in sometimes I talk to like students here at university and others. I mean, we even have an OT program, but that's you know we all kind of coordinate each other off and. There is some interdisciplinary stuff, which I think is a good movement in our university settings to help kind of appreciate what the other profession does. I think um, you brought up some good things that OTs bring to the table. I always, I just had a patient before lunch, um, persistent pain, uh, you know, losing a lot of her ability to function in a high level, high stress role. And uh, she's been through a lot of hands-on manual on different things and still having a lot of troubles. And, um, you know, she's the typical sometimes with persistent, persistent pain is, yeah, I feel awesome after treatment, but then I get home and there's that pain again and you know we have a good discussion about yeah this is like you know the you know the most comfortable therapeutic safe environment forever and or for you but at home that's where all you know we had already talked about stressors and their effect on right. you know systemic regulation homeostatic regulation she's a right. do student so she's well into the science so i could nerd out a little bit with her but um I, she got it but i think yeah it's that's where i think you have an awesome ability and i know some pts as well who are able to work in the home with the person and then because that gives you so much unique ability to see where their where their specific challenges are of not only just physically but maybe some of the relationship stuff that will exist yes. at home and, yes. and different things that you can maybe help not only treat the patient but treat their environment a little bit as far as maybe some of the people around the environment and different things yeah. you find yourself doing a little a lot of that with uh, your clients as far as involving you know i know just i likely know this answer but I, i'd love for others to hear it as far as involving that patient's environment in your treatments and maybe the people in that environment. 
Oh, absolutely. Um, so when I do like pain education, let's say, you know, I've, I've kind of developed a way of doing it that, that fits me, but it's also very interactive because I don't do it with just my, the person in pain. I do it with the entire family. And so we sit around the dinner table and we put paper and markers out and I have a little PowerPoint. We go through, we draw pictures, we laugh, we talk about how they experience. Um, I, I just use the example of stubbing your toe because it's usually non-threatening for people and we can kind of talk through how people respond to that and how they, and then we educate them on, you know, what's different about the family member in pain and what, what's going on in their body and how can they understand each other. And so it starts a whole conversation. It's fantastic um, and really meaningful for them because how often do families sit around a table and talk about pain and, and how they feel about it and what they're trying to ask questions and understand. So yeah, definitely do that. So the, when I work with kids or teens, you know, parents obviously very involved with that, but you have to be with the whole family. And so in, in environments, you know, environments, we're, we're sensory processors, right? And so that's, this is another area that occupational therapists have as more of a specialty is, is kind of assessing and helping people with sensory regulation, self-regulation skills for sensory processing, because sometimes people aren't aware of how they're wired and what's environment that might be contributing to some dysregulation of their nervous system. And um, I, I do a, a little uh, webinar, or, well, it's not a webinar yet. I've done it live, a little talk on sensory processing emotions and pain and all the connections there. And, I use the example of a couple of clients that I had at the same time that were very opposite when we did kind of a sensory exploration. Um, we look at, you know, visual, touch, uh, taste, um, perception, vestibular, all, you know, all the senses. And with these two clients, I had, had one who, she came out very over responsive on vestibular movement. So, and, and she presented as a person who was afraid to pick up a glass of water or she was going to throw her back out. That's, she wouldn't open a car door or even a cupboard because she was so afraid and, and had this wired in belief system that it was going to hurt her back and mess up her back. And then on the other hand, I had this other client who she, she, so this gal was in the most distressed when she had to do something like that. And this other gal was in the most distressed if she had to lay down and rest. That's when her pain was the worst. That's when she was the most distressed because she actually had an under-responsive vestibular movement system. She was somebody who always needed, she needed to be moving. She could go out and walk, no pain. She, she could do stuff and she was fine. But if she had to lay down, super distressing. And so that really helped inform my practice with them on knowing how to work with them. So the one gal, obviously we have to kind of braid her into and work on those, you know, red flags and her emotions about it. Um, but the other gal, she did have to rest sometimes. So, but she needed some vestibular input. So we got her a hammock. And it helped her because she was get she could get some movement while she was resting. So just little strategies like that. I have some people, because when we're in pain, our sensitivities, you know, we know we have less tolerance for something. So maybe you were kind of light sensitive before and bright lights and, or noise bothered you, but you're in pain now, they'll bother you even more. Um, I discovered I hate grocery shopping. I'm actually sensitive to those environments. There's noise, lights, movements, you're maneuvering around. I still hate it. Hey, I'm out of pain, but I still hate it. So I do online grocery shopping. So, you know, those are some things that I might explore with people. I had one client, she actually went to a different grocery store because every time she went shopping, she kept running into people and she didn't want to talk to them. It was too much. And so she went to a, a, one farther way, quieter, totally changed her life. It was like, yes, now I can do more and I feel better. And so, you know, those are some kind of practical, but also sensory kind of things that we do. Yeah. So it's almost like bridging that social piece and the sensory piece of obviously you're always bringing in the senses of your social situations um, and yeah. context. So I, yeah, I dig that. I think, Anything else you do? Because I think we're always trying to, you know, they, we, that IS conference, you know, Daniel Carr talks about the really reframing it as a socio psychological biologic process instead of putting the biologic on the front end. Yes. 
Um, any other strategies that you maybe f use or, or are big on with kind of the socialization piece when it comes? Because I know that's where a lot of, of clinicians sometimes struggle or maybe don't even address it. I know PT traditionally, I haven't. I, I have tried to make more of a point to like make these movements be meaningful to get them back into social situations. Yes. Yes. Do things that find value in socialization because we know there's so much decent research on yes. socialization and modulating pain situations. Yes. But uh, w I'd be curious what your kind of perspective on that, maybe how it can apply to uh, you know, pain care practice. Yes. So uh, I'll give you an example first, and then I'll tell you about this this new uh, tool that I've been involved in developing, which helps with that. Because um, I explore that too, and and. Um, I had a client with pedendal neuralgia, so sitting is very painful. Um, and, you know, we've been working together for a while, but it was interesting at, at one point in a conversation during one session, I suddenly began to realize something that I hadn't really thought of before. And that was that the thing that was, had the most value for her. So, you know, we talk about values, right? And, and we have to explore that and it has to do with the social pieces and the meaning of life but the thing that actually had the most value in her life was sitting having dinner with her family sitting in church and going out to coffee with friends and guess what sitting is her most painful thing and so because those were such high value the emotions around those things and the protection was even greater and so it opened a conversation into that for her and an awareness that she became aware of that that, that, that was one of her um, red flags, if you will, to start to work on that emotional response because it just had so much value. And so she, she started working on that. Actually, this conversation was probably, oh, eight months or so ago. And I just talked to her about a month ago and oh, that's all gone. It's all gone. Mm -hmm. And she's, She's just done that work herself. She's now able to do all those things. So bravo for her. Um, and so, you know, trying to dig into that, though, is a real challenge for us, right? And in, in the clinic, we have limited time and ability, and so it, it really is tough to do it. But um, there's a new tool, and right now it's just for occupational therapists. It just got released the end of August. I've been working with Karen Atler at Colorado State University on this for a few years, kind of as a clinical advisor. And it's called the Occupational Experience Profile. And when I first heard about it, I went up to Karen and I said, this is the piece I need in my practice. I need this. This, this is what I'm looking for. I'm trying to, trying to figure out how to get, get this data from people, you know, how, how to figure out how they're experiencing life in a deeper, meaningful way than just looking at pacing or environment or what you're doing and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm talking to her about her making it interprofessional so that it can be more available. So stay tuned for that. We're, she's, she's kind of, she's like on board. So we're, we're talking about it. But so what the occupational experience profile does is it, it's kind of a, you can do it as an interview or you can have people kind of keep a diary of what they do during the day. But the, the way it works is you, you capture all this really cool data. First of all, what do they identify the activity as like you know sitting on the couch could be resting for somebody or it could be engaging in tv or conversation or you know it could be different we could call one thing self-care and someone else could call it um entertainment or leisure whatever so what the activity means to you and then there's four measures of how we experience it so that's why it's called the occupation experience profile it's like not just what we do, but what are we experiencing when we do it? And the four measures are pleasure, how much pleasure, how productive do we feel doing this activity, how much restoration do we feel? Like, does it take our energy away or is it giving us energy back? And then the, the last one is social connection. What's the social connection? What are we experiencing? And what I found working with uh, people in pain and exploring this is they get so many ahas about this because we can also like kind of look at pain. Um, we can attach values to it. Are you living, you know, according to what your values are? Does your pain go up when you're with a certain people or you're out in a certain environment? Because it also attracts where you're at, you know, what environments you're in. So we can kind of pull all this cool data out of there. 
And people can then look at, well, what do I want in my life? What is the right balance for me? Am I getting enough pleasure or productivity or restoration or social connection? What do I feel like I need more? They get to identify it and then they can begin to make those changes for themselves. And, you know, some people want to be way more productive and, and they, maybe they're missing that if they're not able to work anymore. How can they find that in another activity? Um, I had a client who realized that her pain went up because she was alone all the time at her home. She lived alone. She got a roommate and it helped. So it's like, this is data that I would never have thought of that, right? My brain would never think of that. But when she did this and she explored it and we talked about it, she came to those awarenesses herself, which is like, which I love because that's, that's what we all need to do. We need to figure out, you know, what is it? that we need. So I love this tool. Um, it's, it helped, it's helped inform my practice for the last few years and helps kind of dig deeper into that meaningful activity. And, and, and I like, I like that restoration piece because I think if you can, you tie that to like an analogy that we often hear this, this overflowing cup and how much things are we doing to, you know, give us more room in the cup if you want right. to that way, as far as what kind of things are we doing to, you know, some people use the bank account analogy. Are, are you just withdrawing constantly? Or are you ever making deposits? And I, right. I like that kind of thing of the model because I think so many times too is, is PTs is maybe a little bit off of the, that topic, but we're so focused on the input level as far as like we're going to input into the tissues and, mm-hmm. and all these things. And it's all about what we're doing from our exercise and our strengthening and, and not saying that stuff's completely bad, but I mean, look at the things you're talking about. I mean, getting a roommate is, you know, that, was a pain relieving, you know, mm-hmm. maybe not an intervention you'd say, but it, for her it was, right. um, and then, you know, but then also looking at what people, the, the emotions and the, the perceptions of these inputs, like we are so focused on the input oftentimes with our technique or whatever it may be, which again, not terrible, but that perception of it, you know, that, that right. perception of that input from that patient's back when she couldn't sit meant not losing all these valued activities of right. having coffee with, friends and, and sitting and having dinner with family. I think that's the piece that I think at least from a physiotherapy standpoint and maybe other more biomechanical tissue driven professionals, we don't see the human side of what that symptom is, you know, and what that symptom represents to the person who's experiencing it. Um, mm-hmm. And man, I think you guys in occupational therapy are, have been you know, well ahead of that as far as really getting to know the person and, and all that stuff. And you, especially with your emotional work and different things like that. How do you think that relates to, and it may or may or may not, I don't know. I'm just curious with like mindfulness. Cause I know mindfulness is like being able to be present with yes. that input from your back, for instance, and not casting this judgment and reaction to it and letting it be there. And it kind of almost like channeling your emotional reaction to it. Is that kind of similar from what your training is with the uh, emotional work? So it, in, um, in the work I do, I kind of expand on mindfulness because I, I've kind of seen in, in not, not always, but sometimes mindfulness just becomes another exercise for people. And so it doesn't become really meaningful and applied to their life in a bigger context, if you will. Um, and, and so that's what I really want to help people, lead people to. So I teach self-compassion, okay, because, you know, we talk about acceptance right? And acceptance and commitment therapy. I would say self-compassion is kind of my term that's on a similar level because it really is about how can I be, how can I care for myself and give my body and my emotions what, what I need? How, how can I have self-kindness? So self-compassion, elements of self-compassion from Kristen Neff's research, and she's a self-compassion researcher. Um, the elements are mindfulness, but self-kindness and common humanity. So there's three skills there, not just mindfulness. So it's, it's being able to practice self-kindness and common humanity. Common humanity is recognizing that what I'm experiencing is, is kind of, un- it's not just unique, it's not just me, that other people also experience this. This can be really difficult in long-term pain because often I experienced, I was very isolated, I didn't know anybody else at the time in pain, I, you know, and none of my care providers knew what to do for me. Um, and so it was very difficult for me to connect to 
that this was something that other people also experienced. It was common to humans. And so I think we're making it more, you know, people more aware that there's a lot of people out there and there is a common humanity. So, but those are the skills. And so um, the mindfulness practice, I actually connected to interception awareness and, and self-regulation. And that also goes into emotional self-regulation. It's kind of like, what are you feeling, right? And the thing is that what we feel in our body happens first. Our body gets the first shot at it. Then we feel an emotion and then we have a thought. So it's not, it's not like thoughts come first, emotions, body. We experience something. It happens. We feel it here first. And then we kind of have some kind of emotion and thought that can, you know, prefrontal cortex kicks in like what, whatever we're going to make meaning out of what's going on in our body. And we all know, right, that we're meaning making beings. We're always trying to figure out perception wise, what things mean. And and we make wrong perceptions based on experience and memories or emotional, whatever it is. And how can we reframe that? So that's how I kind of see mindfulness with the people I work with is that I call it paying attention and listening. And then can we practice this self-kindness, this self-compassion, and recognize what's going on, what do I need, how can I kind of care for myself, and I think some people will say, hold this lightly, right, and mindful, how do I hold this emotion, this feeling lightly, or whatever, and then take care of myself, and what I need to do, and I'll tell you, self-compassion is really hard skill for people. Kristen Neff has a, has a test on her website, selfcompassion.org. It's also available for um, use in research if anybody wants to do some research in this area. Um, uh, I, I, you can get a score and it tests you on all these elements. <clears throat> so you can kind of see where you're at. And <clears throat> I tell my clients when I give them this test, nobody's beat my score yet. I had the lowest score when I very first took this test. And her research actually shows that people in helping professionals are the worst at practicing self-compassion. We should think about that, right? We're really good at trying to help other people, helping them, being compassionate, empathetic. You take care of you. We put ourselves last. We tend to have the lowest levels of self-compassion. And so it's a hard, can be a hard skill for us to learn. Um, but we can, we can learn it. And, and so it, I just see it as a kind of an underlying skill, a foundational skill to, to everything that we do because um, people have to live in the real world. You know, it's, we're doing the best we can to help support the treatments, you know, what, what we're trying to help people, bodies recover and emotions, but we really have to help people to be able to do this in their real life, in their real world. And, and I just see self-compassion is that foundational skill we can really be kind to ourselves not judgmental and take care of ourselves then we have a lot of opportunity to help ourselves heal no absolutely Uh, i like a lot of the concepts you talk about there as far as the common humanity piece i think is a a big one because we have a healthcare system that so isolates people and, and pulls them away from any thoughts that there's anybody who's in the same situation that they're in. And I, well, some of the more powerful things I've done with patients has been plugging them in with Jaletta's blog and talking Mm -hmm. to folks like yourself who've been through it and others who can see that, man, this is a human thing that other people can experience. And maybe, you know, I don't have to be so hard on myself that I'm a failure of some sort or anything like that, that a lot of people have gone through it and have thankfully come out the other side of it. So yeah, I, I think, Again, these are all great examples of skills when we look at that social, emotional, the, the humanity of the whole situation. I think that right. that's a beautiful um, demonstration of how, and again, I, I, to bang on our profession, I think we, we got to look past the musculoskeletal, biomechanical human, and not to say it's completely irrelevant, but sometimes we just lose that whole humanity piece. And if, you, if like work compensation would just see the humanity piece of it and treat the humanity piece of it, I bet they would save a world of money and, and suffering, but that heaven knows how hard that'll be to change any of that stuff. But yeah. 
Yeah. It's messy though. It's messy. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's hard. I, we, we like certainty. We want to, we want to know methods, right? I mean, right. We're, we're all studying all the time. I don't know. I know you are Mark and I do too. And it over, it's overwhelming because the more I study, the more I know, I don't know. And, and then I can feel really inadequate and then I can be like, Oh man, you know, what else have I got to do? I got to go get this course or read that book and more research papers. And I can't hold it all in my brain anymore because we, we really want some certainty for ourselves too, that what we're doing is going to make a difference. And, and we like to hold on to some kind of elements of certainty, just like the people in pain that we're working with want some certainty. But the reality is, is that it's, a lot of it's really uncertain. It's really messy because we are humans and we're all going to be a little different. And, and we have to be, you have to be kind to yourself as a physical therapist, you know, not, you guys are great. And, and we're all, you know, we're all doing the best we can and we're being humans with humans, right? That's what, what we're trying to just be a human with another human. No, I think you put it well there as far as it's just not going to be black and white. And I think that's the unfortunate part of how maybe university training is. We force kids to learn it black and white and to put it on a multiple choice answer on a board exam. Yet the clinic looks nothing like that at all. And there's just so much gray area. I have a student with me right now. who <laughs> We've had a few persistent pain patients where I've said, well, let's have you take lead and see how things go. And then it's you can quickly see like, the, the students, like I always call the deer in headlights look, and then I just jump in and, and nudge in there. But yeah, it's, it's, it's something that we just don't prepare students well for to kind of tackle some of those massively gray, challenging emotions are messy. People's uh, thoughts and beliefs and things are so complex and different things that have come to the table. What do you think would be some ways if you, if you had the magical ability of casting your the ability to change education maybe in the ot realm around pain but maybe also just in in healthcare in general around pain i know there were some discussions around that in boston at the association meeting but i'm just curious what your thoughts would be how could we help people be see the human humanity side of of pain better in their respective disciplines yeah well (laughs) Yeah, good, there's a good, lot of big, wow, what a big open-ended question there, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Just gave me this huge, uh, uh, you know, I, I, okay, the thing that's coming to my mind, actually, um, is something that happened at the conference during Gilletta's talk that, um, where it was, it really became clear to me how much we as professionals could use a little care ourselves, if you will. Um, Because I think that being able to sit with people in their mess and all that loss, that grief, that shame, the emotion, those are painful, the tragedies sometimes. Um, Man, we got to be comfortable with our own emotions. And we got to be taking care of ourselves. And we've got to be practicing authentically. You know, that's why I made some changes. I did, you know, I do things differently because they fit me. I decided, you know, I got to have fun. It's restorative. I got to have, you know, and so that's why I made pain science really fun because then it's fun for me Mm -hmm. and it works for the people too, because then it's fun for that. So, so, you know, I, I've, if I was, if I was working back in a clinic and I, I wouldn't, I'd be burning out, I'd be struggling, and I think I'd be struggling to connect with people because it's not authentic to me. Um, And so I think that change like this that we're talking about, we're talking about huge cultural, social kinds of change, right? Legion of change, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just what we do, but it's kind of who we are as people. And so I, I guess I would say, I would hope that we would all invest in our own work, you know, our own emotional processing, getting comfortable with our own stories, our own narratives. Um, I wrote my life story, my memoir when I was in pain, it was really hard and really good because I had to get comfortable. It, I, you know, I realized that in order to grow up emotionally, I had to you know, allow myself to feel some feelings that I hadn't felt and 
learn some things about myself that were hard learnings and be able to go through that. And so, you know, I, I think, I think we're all doing the best we can, but um, it's hard to sit with that suffering. I, I had a, a gal that I talked to yesterday on the phone, kind of a pre-phone consult who's sharing her story on the phone with me, you know, and so here's the reality of it. Her story is awful. It's just horrible. And we hear these, you know, and it's not just her, but her family's also falling apart and the issues are just not just pain, right? It's huge in the way it's affected her life and where she's at and how she's contemplated suicide. And we hear those things. And so, you know, I just try to, to give what I can and listen and support as best I can. And I know I can't be perfect. I just can't. It's not humanly possible. And then I get off the phone and I have to process that because that's emotional for me too. Cause I, you know, I feel it. I feel it. And I'm okay with that. It's not, you know, it's just like uh, holding that space for someone. It, it's hard on us too. And we have to be able to know what do we need to do then to take care of ourselves so we can con continue to be able to be there for somebody. So you gave me that big question. So <laughs> No, and you, you, knocked, you knocked it out of the park. I thought that was great. Um, as much as I'd love to spend more time chatting with you, and I'm sure we'll have more chances to chat, at least I hope so, at uh, future conferences and stuff, and um, maybe even online, of course. But uh, I just wanted to personally thank you for joining us today to taking time out of your schedule. I think um, Thanks, Mark. huge value as far as seeing kind of your approach and seeing kind of, you know, a lot of the, the interrelationships of what we're all doing and having some maybe different approaches and languages. But again, um, I love what you just said la there last as far as not being so pressured on the outcome. I think uh, maybe it was Jason Silvernail or somebody, but once that weight off of the shoulders of I have to produce this outcome comes off and you just do your best to be present right. and you try to be someone who's going to lend as much support as you can possibly lend. But in the end, you know, you, you do your best and you can't put that pressure of your outcome on, on you because you will burn out. I mean, I know yeah. for me, that was a massive change for me clinically as far as uh, and I know we had heard Chris Caldwell of the O talk about some of the burnout he's experiencing in his pain practice with trying to be present with patients, yet the structure of that line of medicine just doesn't really bode well for that ability. And yeah, I think you hit on the head. We need to take care of each other, take care of ourselves and make sure that we're giving ourselves, you know, not completely filling our cup up with all the clinical stuff and making sure we're doing some restorative stuff. So yeah. And we call it we call it striving for excellence but not perfectionism we don't want to be perfectionist that's a great way to put it like i i think that nails it for sure well thank you so much for your time Thanks today so much, linda Mark. i i can't wait to uh, see what you're going to be doing in your in your work and I'm, I, I will be following it online and i hope you uh, feel free to participate in some of the discussions you have in our group here um because your perspective is valued and we'd love to have it thanks mark Appreciate it. All right. You have a good rest of your day. Thanks. You too. Bye. Bye.